Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to today's presentation. This is uh, a huge honor for me to be here. My name is Jamie Rose. I am going to be speaking today about careers in humanitarian photojournalism. And um, if this is your first time ever turning into the VNH event space, this incredible Candyland Willy Wonka factory of electronic gadgets and wonderfulness <laughs> is uh, so incredibly inspiring because they offer programs like this every day, I, I'm almost every day of the year. So you can come in and see speakers talk about how to use different kinds of gear and also how to take better pictures, make better pictures, how to use software and all sorts of other wonderful topics. So I highly recommend tuning in to their YouTube channel, making it part of your daily routine. It's, it's really inspiring. and incredibly intimidating to be up here in front of you all. Um, I would first like to just say thank you to b and and the staff for having me today. Um, Kendra, Derek, Stephanie, everyone who helped get this all ready to go. This is um, a true honor for me. And uh, I'd like to thank my family who came in from Ohio <laughs> to come and see me, as also alumni from Seattle <laughs> who came all the way in, uh, just so happened to be there. And then um, I'd like to thank Dotan Sagi who spoke here um, twice now, and he is one of our alumni, and he recommended that uh, I should come and give a presentation, and so it just all worked out that I could. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful to Dotan. He's also going to be speaking here in a couple of weeks, so definitely, definitely tune in and watch the two previous episodes that he did as well. They were excellent. So I should start by telling you who I am and what I do and um, giving you just a little bit of background. We'll start with the good stuff. I am the co-owner of Momenta Group. Momenta has three different divisions. We have our workshops division, which is what most of the people in this room are probably the most familiar with. They are training programs for documentary and humanitarian photography. We do travel documentary workshops, um, one day business skills and other things we'll get into. We have a creative service division. So in fact, many of the alumni from our programs have actually been hired by our creative service division to come and do projects with us. We work predominantly with government agencies and nonprofit agencies to do photo, video, graphic design, web design, and consulting. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. We've been doing both of those for 11 years. And our newest baby division that is turning very rapidly into our largest division is Wildfire Media. That's our nonprofit that we started a few years ago. Um, I have to say, after photographing with nonprofits for almost 20 years, <laughs> I had no idea how difficult it was <laughs> to start a nonprofit organization. And uh, now that we have it established, we are a 501c3. We are dedicated to educating the public about the importance of humanitarian social issues and documentary. So part of what we are doing with Wildfire Media is working with underfunded nonprofit organizations that need their message told. And a lot of the things that we learned with Momenta Group doing our workshops was there are so many tiny little organizations out there that are doing the lion's share of the work in some places, and yet they get the least amount of coverage because they have the least amount of communications assets at their availability. So we work with large donors and um, foundations to help fund projects about those organizations. And we're so excited. Uh, we just recently, I'll just tell you guys because I'm excited. <laughs> it's not a part of the speech. but. Um, we, we, were, we just got our first bequest, so we have a very large estate planning. Uh, someone just came to us and said, I think that I'd like to leave you all of my money. <laughs> and we said, I think that would be incredible. <laughs> and so um, if you want to find us, we are available online at MomentoWorkshops.com. We are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, and then if you want to find me, I, I have a public Facebook account. I think I'm at my friend limit right now, but you can feel free to follow. Uh, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. So I would welcome that you come on there. Just please <laughs> recognize that if you would like to talk to me, um, a lot of people will write notes to Instagram or something and say, hey, Jamie, and I don't actually handle our accounts. So <laughs> Lauren will say hello back to you or Shri. Um, so if you would like to come on a Momento workshop, this is, these are our programs for 2020. They are not up on our website yet. They are in pre-registration. If you would like to pre-register before they go up, I can give you guys that link. Uh, but we are so excited. We're going back to LA. This is our sixth time in LA. Um, 
We are doing Project New Orleans again, which is my favorite workshop because it's New Orleans. <laughs> it's just a barrel of monkeys fun. And that's with um, Annie Flanagan and Marianne Hawkins Savrier, myself, and um, another instructor. And then we'll be doing Project El Paso this year. And part of our project series is photographing nonprofits. So some of our alumni are actually in the audience, which is very exciting. Uh, we'll be doing Project New York City for the very first time. And we say it's by popular demand, and I mean demand. People <laughs> started texting us when we said we were going to announce 2020 and saying, emailing us, when are you coming to New York? So we said, okay, fine, you bullied us into it. We will do New York. Uh, so Thomas Patterson is going to be teaching that, and um, it looks like I'll probably be here too mainly so that I can have as much of the amazing food <laughs> as possible in the city. And then we're doing Project Puerto Rico again next fall, which is, this is our third time going back. It's an incredible workshop. It's really exceptional. I just came back two weeks ago from that. And um, Project India is our international workshop. We potentially will be announcing another international program uh, next year. And then we also have our one day travel and business programs. So. New in 2020 is our Momentum Mentorship Program. Um, that is where five people will be assigned with one non or one of our mentors. They'll have three intense months to work on a particular topic. And then you can decide after three months if you wanna sign up with that mentor again or go with another one. So those will have twice monthly meetings and you'll be with a group of people who all are basically focused on the same topic. So some people will be focused on you know, how do I build my book project? Or how do I edit my final humanitarian portfolio that I need to start marketing? Or in my case, um, I'll be teaching the grant writing and proposal uh, mentoring. So how do you write grants and how do you get your proposal up to snuff? And then we have our one day business programs. I just got back from that, which is why I'm a little hoarse because I've been talking for nine hours a day for two days straight in Washington, DC. Uh, we did marketing for photographers and get funded financing personal projects. And um, then we have our travel select programs, which are pretty exceptional. These are very small exclusive travel programs that we do all around the world. They're pretty great. Um, next year we have the Northwestern, Pacific Northwest Grape Stomp is coming. So you can go photograph the vineyards of the Pacific Northwest stomping all their grapes and it's very visual and fun and messy. And um, we're also doing a very exceptional program that I'm excited about that um, my parents probably know about. But we are going to be doing a momentous select retreat. So it's going to be yoga, massage, and photography and editing of portfolios. So it's basically a time to recenter and focus and um, if you, at the end of two hours, realize that I have a lot of energy, the yoga instructor is my sister, and she makes me look like I'm on decaf. So, <laughs> but she's a lot of fun, and she's really great to travel with, so um, that will be a really fun thing. Um, and for anyone who's watching this program today, and for the next 12 months, we will be offering 10% off to B&H followers, and you can go ahead and email the email address on the screen, info at momentoworkshops.com, and ask for your custom B&H code. So today has two goals. First, I'm going to use my career as an example and show you guys the, the photography that I accumulated from being a humanitarian photographer and letting you get to know a little bit about me and how I sort of stumbled into, strategically stumbled into this career. And then we'll be talking about the practical applications of what I learned along the way. So um, hopefully, if you have any questions throughout the day, please feel free to ask. Um, I'm really excited that you all are here, and for everyone who's on the live stream, thanks and welcome. If you would like to ask any questions, for those of you guys in the audience out there, you can go to the Twitter feed, at Momenta, and you can ask questions. We have them popping up here, and so I can answer anything for the live streaming audience as well. Okay, so the very first class that we had at Syracuse University, where I got my master's degree, I should probably step back for a second and give you a little bit of a background. I'm originally from Ohio. I'm from Kent, Ohio, where Kent State is. Um, yes, that Kent State. And probably because if those of you are old enough to remember that Kent State, uh, it really helps to establish why I got interested, I think, in journalism and communications. Because when you live in a town, probably like Columbine, or now El Paso, or many of the other unfortunate places where major events have happened, you start to get a different perspective on how the world news actually can impact your community. And so growing up in Kent, uh, I had a, uh, 
I was really interested in photography and my parents were photographers, so they had a photo studio and I had cameras around me all the time and then I went to my dad and I said, hey, there's a photography class at my high school that I'd like to take. And he said, here, <laughs> opens up, which now all of us who love cameras, I mean, this like gigantic gear bag that was full of two Mamiya 645s, which he did not give me. And, <laughs> and then the Canon A2E, do you guys remember that? The river camera, as uh, my friend Alex, <laughs> Um, said one time, he said it's a river camera because it's so sturdy that you can come to a river crossing, throw it across the river, swim across yourself, pick it up on the other side, and it's going to be totally fine. <laughs> and and uh, so he gave me that camera, and it, the bug hit, and I really loved it. I, I had great uh, teachers. I joined the newspaper staff, and I said, this is it. This is what I want to do. I saw the movie The Paper, if you've ever seen that movie with Michael Keaton, and I desperately wanted to do exactly that. So I went to my undergraduate, was at American University, and I studied originally journalism, but um, I wanted to be a writer, so I wanted to do writing. And I thought photography, but I kind of didn't know how that would work, because I didn't know that could even be a career that you could do necessarily. And then I um, got an internship, and if you're interested in any of this background, I would say there's a Candid Frame episode where Abari and X and I had a lovely conversation about my, my career and my coming up, and, um, and he's the most incredible interviewer I've ever spoken with. So I think that um, that will give you a nice background. Um, but then I went to Syracuse, and I met Mark Dolan. And for anyone who's out there who knows Mark Dolan, you could totally see the fact that he started his first day of class to us in the photojournalism department, and he said, there is no magic pill. You can't just swallow a pill and be a good photographer. It takes a lot of hard work and dedication and practice and discipline, and it doesn't just happen for you. And so as long as you understand that I can't give you the magic pill to make you better, you just have to keep working at it, <laughs> we're gonna get along fine. And so Mark was one of the first people who ever introduced me to grant writing. And I had to do a thesis, um, and people could choose whatever you wanted to do. I had a friend, Christian Fuchs, who actually did a thesis on Flatbush Avenue. He came down every weekend that he could and he would just go from one side of Flatbush to the other and photograph, you know, just what was the street photography of Flatbush like at that time. And I had a, the privilege of hearing a young lady come back and present her thesis and talk about it. Um, her name is Julia Cumes and she is South African and she decided to do her thesis on the first children the year after apartheid was lifted at home. And so she photographed a white child, a black child, and a colored child, and what was their life like? And so that's the actual phrase that is used in South Africa. Um, and I thought, I want to do something international. That sounds fantastic. How do I do that? <laughs> and so I went to Mark and I said, I think I'd like to, I'd like to get involved with doing more work. And I firmly believe that like all great stories have some sort of root in NPR because <laughs> I think NPR is one of the best reporting organizations in the world. And I was listening to a story about these Filipino doctors who had been kidnapped while they were trying to vaccinate babies in rural areas and they were kidnapped by um, you know the sort of Muslim fighter faction and um, they were holding them ransom and I think they had killed one of them. And I was so incredibly furious. I was like, of all the people in all the world that you're gonna kidnap, a bunch of doctors trying to vaccinate babies in like rural areas. That's who you choose. This is abhorrent and someone should be doing something to talk about how amazing it is that these guys could be making millions of dollars doing surgery somewhere and instead they're, they're risking their lives. And so that was when I really got the bug to start focusing on volunteer healthcare providers. And I went to do some research. And uh, Mark said, you can start grant writing for this. Like people will give you money to do projects like this. You just have to go out and find it. So of course I thought, well, that's easy. I can totally do that. I'll go to the, the grant writing department. And they said, I'm sorry at the university. They said, we only really help um, master or PhD candidates find this kind of funding. And I said, well, is there funding available for master's programs? They said, yes, but we won't do the research for you. I said, you do the research for PhD candidates? And they're like, well, of course. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, first of all, I want to get a PhD so someone will do my work for me. And second of all, that's a, I don't care. I will be here every single day. And so I started researching grants and I applied for dozens of them and um, I got a few. 
So one of the things we're going to talk about in the afternoon session when it comes to the practical application of how to make a career at this, if grant writing and crowdfunding and things like that is something you're interested in, um, it, it takes a while. It, there's a lot of rejection. It's not always fun and friendly. <laughs> so I started doing research and I found this organization called Physicians for Human Rights and they were um, a group of Israeli and Palestinian doctors who were working in the West Bank to provide medical um, relief to to people who are in you know rural and isolated areas and right when I started researching this project and I started grant writing the second intifada started so my family was super excited that a 20 nothing year old you know doe-eyed has no international experience in the Middle East whatsoever does not speak Hebrew or Arabic <laughs> photographer just up and decided to go and um, it was it was hard and difficult and it um, helped me get to know the wonderful Yiddish word that was thrown at me quite a bit which was chutzpah <laughs> because people would ask how did you get across the border and I'd say I, I don't know I just walked <laughs> And how did you get past checkpoints? And I said, you know, I, if you look like you belong, look, people just kind of treat you like you belong sometimes. And so the doctors and the nurses were incredible. The Israeli doctors would take in, in Israel, you know, they only have one day of a weekend, which is Saturday, that's their day off. And these doctors would take that one day off where they were working at a hospital six days a week. They would spend their day off getting into a hot ambulance, piled up with medicine on their lap and this, you know, <laughs> ridiculously unaware photographer with them crammed into the ambulance and go out into rural areas and so I was so lucky to be with them and have them teach me all of the things that I needed to learn on my first assignment from really great mentors who kept me safe and kept me hydrated <laughs> and um, were, were very incredibly kind and open with their lives and um, I ended up deciding that I, I had an apartment in Tel Aviv, but I decided that I was just gonna stay for um, about a month and a half in the clinic that you see right in the background. Um, I slept on the floor at the clinic. It was right next to a mosque, which if any of you guys have ever lived right next to a mosque, when the call to prayer happens every morning at the crack of dawn is actually kind of the greatest thing in the world for a photographer because that's when golden hour starts. So I would just pop right up and start photographing. And I really had an incredible experience. It taught me a lot. Um, I thought, you know, I wanted to be a war photographer. I wanted to be James Noctway or Andrea Bruce, and that was, that was going to be who I was going to turn out to be. And then I was in my very first combat situation with bullets flying by my head, and I, I very embarrassingly looked at a 16-year-old kid who was one of the volunteers and said, I'm terrified and I need to leave right now. <laughs> and he said, I'll walk you back. <laughs> and I said, okay, thanks. And then he said, where do you wanna go? And I said, I wanna go to the hospital. I wanna go where they're bringing everyone else in. And I want to be around the people who are trying to help. And so um, how many of you have seen the movie, um, Won't You Be My Neighbor? It's about uh, Mr. Rogers. Like everything we all need to know in the world, we can learn from Mr. Rogers about being good people, I think. And Mr. Rogers has this expression that his mother taught him, which was, you know, that there's always someone helping, so go find the helpers. And that's what I learned with working with these doctors. They were so incredible. Um, this is the gynecologist who would go out and do gynecology exams on the floor in an abandoned building to make sure that women had proper pelvic exams and prenatal care and postnatal care. So I thought I was gonna come back to the United States and I was going to get a job. I had graduated, I defended my thesis. Um, and I thought, this is fantastic. Everyone's going to be so impressed with me because I've been in combat <laughs> and I've done international work. And I started pitching my work around and people said, um, yeah, we've seen this before and better. Have you seen Carolyn Cole's work? <laughs> I was like, yes, I've seen Carolyn Cole's work. <laughs> and so I knew that I needed to get a job. I wanted to do humanitarian healthcare. And this was around like the, you know, the early, early aughts, this is around 2002. And it wasn't really a, job at that time to be a humanitarian photographer. The, the humanitarian industry hadn't really understood the power of storytelling and documentary just yet. And so I had to do my very first pivot. <laughs> uh, I was very interested in politics. I went to school at um, American University in Washington, D.C. And I had a good friend from growing up, Liz Sidoti, 
who got a job as a political reporter. And I had planned to go live in Cleveland because that's you know near where I'm from. And I thought I'll just freelance there and I'll figure things out. And I had literally put down a deposit on an apartment. <laughs> This is like one of my dad's favorite stories. Put down the deposit on an apartment. Liz calls me up the next day and said, hey, I just got offered a job in Washington, D.C. Do you want to come and leave, live with me and be my roommate? And I was like, yes. And so for some reason, I don't know who this blessed landlord was. I walked up and said, I'm going to need my deposit back 24 hours later. And he said, OK. And so I went down to D.C. We did not live together which is a very good idea because neither one of us would have survived the first year, I guarantee it. But we lived right across the street from each other. And I started covering politics and um, I was predominant, I, I covered about from the Bush administration until the start of the Obama administration. And I was very lucky um, to get into there. It was a lot of hard work. I always tell everyone I'm not the best photographer in the room. I'm not the best photographer in this room. <laughs> I am. I just worked really, really, really hard. And I put myself out there as much as possible. I showed my portfolio to everyone who would look at it. And at the same time, you know, I knew that the experience that I would get on Capitol Hill would be invaluable for making the connections that I wanted to do and to being published. And, and it's very exciting. I mean, being in politics is awesome. It, this doesn't have anything to do with humanitarian photography, obviously, but you get to meet, you know, some people who turn out to be kind of famous later on. And <laughs> you get to have experiences of being on deadline, and deadline that is no joke. I mean, I, I can't tell you, I think the most nerve-wracking experience was I, I, I became on contract with the New York Times um, predominantly, and I was working with two of the best photographers in the world who were the staff photographers, Doug Mills and Stephen Crawley were my two mentors, and I couldn't ask for two better photographers to mentor me. And, um, and I think the most nerve-wracking one was when I got a telephone call. If you know anything about Washington, there's Capitol Hill up here, and then the Smithsonian's down there, but it's like, very far away. It doesn't look that way when you're watching Game of Thrones, but or Game of Thrones. It's kind of the same thing. House of Cards, but <laughs> when you're looking at that time lapse, it looks like it's really close, but it's not. And they said, we need you to go down to the Smithsonian. You have to take a picture of the original Wright Brothers plane. It was 3 o'clock. 4 o'clock is front page um, editing deadline for the New York Times. You have to get it back, and this is for the front page. <laughs> And I was like, do you have any idea how far away the Capitol building is from the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum? And they're like, uh-huh, good luck. And so I literally went in. I had 10 minutes to shoot a front page picture for the New York Times, turn around, run back, and transmit. It was a little nerve-wracking. So at the same time, it, you had to you know, really up your game to be competitive in that environment as well. And you had to learn about all of the policy that was being made that was affecting the humanitarian issues I was the most interested in. And so I started to realize that the world of humanitarian photography was much larger than just the things that I had been exposed to at the time. This is the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And if anyone remembers the you know, amazing documentary coverage that was done of the civil rights movement, this was you know, the re-upping of that. It, it's not necessarily humanitarian, but it was a really important day. If anyone ever has an opportunity to ask your child to go job shadow someone, try to find whoever will say yes. I got this lovely young lady job shadowing me on this day, and it's a very crazy story that I'll tell you guys later if you want. But basically, she ended up the day. I mean, Jesse Jackson was there. There's an egg salad sandwich that comes into it. It's all crazy. And the 16-year-old kid was like, this is the greatest job. And I said, come work on Capitol Hill. It's a lot of fun. Um, and you know, you got to cover major events. This was Nancy Pelosi swearing in, one of two times I've ever cried on assignment. I'm just, I'm not genuinely like a big crier anyway, but um, everyone was crying. Politics aside, when the first female speaker of the house was sworn in and you got to be in that room, it was electric. And I was behind my lens, because I, unlike the reporters, had the ability to cover up my face so no one could see that I was having, having a little bit of an emotional background. And then I'd look around and everyone was crying and it was really impressive and, and it was wonderful. I especially love the two little kids in the audience because they can bring their children to uh, the swearing in of Congress. And so there's just like random children being sworn into Congress. Um, you had to cover a lot of issues that had long-term effects. And I think this was part of the education of me as a humanitarian photographer as well. Things just don't go away. Um, this was the 9-11 Commission, which went on for a very long time. And uh, Mr. Bloomberg was down quite a bit to testify. 
if anyone ever asks me, like, what's it like to work on Capitol Hill, I always point them to that photo. I think we counted one time, there's 28 different cameramen in that room. <laughs> and you're all competing with each other in a very stressful way, and you have to get to the front page, and you have to sometimes, you know, photograph many, many, many photos for the front page, the inside, the website, the slideshows, all that good stuff. And you learn about, you know, balanced coverage, I think. One of my favorite questions that's asked to me about humanitarian photography is, how, how do you manage your ethics as a humanitarian photographer as opposed to a journalism, you know, being in photojournalism? Like, how do you change your ethics? <laughs> and I think it's the most absurd question ever because ethics are ethics. You either have them or you don't. <laughs> The example that I use is like saying, I only cheat on my husband when I'm on vacation, so it's technically not cheating. Like, no, you're still cheating. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Your ethics are your ethics. And when you are a photojournalist, you know, we now, gosh, they're under a huge microscope. Everyone wants, you know, we're all talking about fake news and truth in media and how important that is. And it's m even more important, I think, sometimes in humanitarian issues. And we've all seen what happens when, you know, nonprofits try to fudge their numbers a little bit or fudge their donor acquisition models or, you know, don't take accountability for what they're doing. And so I knew that I wanted to go back to what I was doing. I just couldn't figure out exactly how to balance that. So I started using every opportunity I could to grant write and see if I could possibly go on another assignment. And so I started getting itchy about four years in, and I started just doing some research, and I said, I have, to, <laughs> I have to get out of this place. I am photographing the same people in the same rooms in the same light all the time, and I'm going a little insane. So I, um, I did probably one of my first big life lessons was ask someone who's from the country of which you are planning to go, what's something no one else knows about your country or your city or your place that other people should know about. And I started to tell people, I'm really interested in humanitarian medical work. I really want to photograph medical re relief providers. I really want to photograph medicine. And so we have a um, adopted family member. My mother takes in strays of all kinds, including human beings. <laughs> um, one day I showed up and she said, oh, by the way, I met a young lady in the lounge at where she was getting her PhD at Kent State. And uh, she's an international exchange student and her housing fell through. So she's going to take your sister's room because my sister graduated and gone off to have her own life. She's going to take your sister's room and live with us for the next year. And her name's Kigendo and she's from Kenya. <laughs> I was like, what? And Kigendo was amazing. She taught me the, uh, she taught me the best way to make tea in the world. Africans make delicious tea and she told me that I was doing it all wrong and I was and her sister is a doctor and she said when I said I, I think I want to go somewhere and I, I'll be perfectly honest with you guys I choose a lot of my locations early on based on the fact that I knew that I wasn't gonna have a huge budget and do they speak English <laughs> so Israel um, yep almost everybody spoke English and in Kenya it's you know one of their second it's the second language and so I said okay let's do this and she said my sister works at a hospital where they it's the largest public hospital and they have a problem where women keep abandoning their babies in the hospital and so the doctors and nurses are left to care for them until they can get them well enough to put them into an orphanage and so I said, okay, that would be great. I would love to photograph, let me talk to her. And she was wonderful. She let me stay in her house for two weeks until I found an apartment in Nairobi. And for six months, I saved up to do this story. Um, this is part of the like practical how to be a humanitarian photographer. Um, plan, 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 plan some more, run your plan by somebody, and then plan a little bit more after that. <laughs> because I saved as much money as I possibly could I sold my car, I put everything into one of those pods, those little pod storage things, and I said, okay, I'm gonna do this. I had a return flight that I was kind of tentative about, and I said, I'm just gonna go for at least four months and do the story and see what else can happen. And um, I left and I told everybody, I'm going to Africa, let's meet at 18th Street Lounge, which is my favorite place in DC. <laughs> Thank you, Thievery Corporation, for making that possible. And um, when I went, I, she let me stay in her house, I got an apartment, and I started photographing this story about these children who are, as I learned, the orphanages wouldn't necessarily take them because they were all full, 
and the government would only authorize three orphanages, one that took, two that took children who were <coughs> physically, mentally healthy children, and another one that would take mentally or physically handicapped kids. And that was the only one that would take children with HIV as well. And so they were booked to capacity. So these children grew up in the hospital and were taken care of by the doctors and nurses until an opening came about or until someone agreed to adopt them. And so this, this young boy had um, s severe spectrum issues and was just had to be kept in his own room because he would get violent and it was really sad but they just loved him to pieces and he was really well cared for. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the photographer Todd Heisler. He's incredible. Um, he gave a presentation one time when he was still at the Rocky Mountain News when they were doing a project trying to get permission from the military to at the beginning of the Iraq war to allow their staff to photograph, because they have a big military base right outside of where Rocky Mountain News is, to photograph the caskets coming in. And um, for a while there was, if, if you guys remember during the Bush administration, there was this huge blackout. No one was allowed to see caskets. We weren't allowed to talk about death. And so Todd and Janet Reeves, the uh, director of photography, went to sit down with the government, or with the military, and um, they met a, I can't remember what his rank was, but he said, you have to go find the yes man. You've got to find the man in the military who has the authority to say yes. Because you've been trying all these people and, you know, human affair, human resources and things like that. And they're going to say no. Go find the yes man in the military and you'll be able to get it done. And so they finally found a yes man after months and months and months of trying. And so to get access to the story was actually very difficult. I had to... This is one of the things that we talk about in the workshop a lot. Whenever somebody will come back and be like, <laughs> Della knows this, will come back and be like, my nonprofit was being very you know, stubborn today. They wouldn't let me have access to this, and I don't know what to do. And I will usually tell this story. So the, the first time that I went <laughs> to the hospital, I talked with the, you know, Kigendo's sister who said, you know, yes, go ahead, go talk to my director of uh, pediatrics. So I go trotting in the office and he said, oh, this is wonderful. I would love you to do this project. And I had like a little small portfolio book that I brought with me to show him what I do. And he was like, sounds great. Oh, you just have to get permission from the director of surgery. And I said, okay, where's that? So I go trotting across the hospital thinking this is going to take one day. I'll get a signed form and I'll be done. Because honestly, working for the New York Times completely spoiled me. And anytime I'd walk in anywhere, people would be like, what can I do for you and so I went to them and I showed them my letters of credential and he said this sounds fantastic you need to go talk to the vice president of the hospital and then it started to click like oh this is gonna be a lot more difficult than I thought and I just kept getting passed up and up and up the chain until finally I went to the office of the last person of the day I think it was about five o'clock in the afternoon and I went in and I said and there's this lovely young lady secretary standing there and she said you know, what can I do for you? And I said, I'm here to get permission to photograph the hospital. Here's my project proposal. Here's all my letters of credential, everything like that. And she said, oh, I'm sorry, he's left for the day. And I said, oh, well, when will he be back? And she said, tomorrow. And I said, great, like what time tomorrow exactly? And he said, she said, I think probably around 10 a.m. And I said, okay, so I go trottling off and I leave the next day. I have a very big breakfast with a lot of coffee because I enjoy caffeine. This is important. <laughs> I sit down in the office at exactly 10 a.m. and I said, okay, and she's like, oh, he hasn't in yet. And I said, all right, and so I wait for about an hour and she's just clicking away at her computer and not paying any attention to me. And then I said, I just need to use the restroom. I'll be right back. So I go to the restroom, I come back. She said, oh, I'm sorry, he left for the afternoon. He won't be back for another two hours. And then I realized, oh, you're giving me the runaround. It's on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you don't know what it's like to have a stubborn Italian girl in your office. And okay. And so I said, when will he be back tomorrow? And she said, I think probably around 9 or 10. And I said, great. So I showed up the next day. I did not have a lot of coffee. <laughs> I showed up the next day. I had a banana and a magazine and a book and the newspaper. And I walked in the door and I said, I'm here for my meeting. And she said, oh, I don't know when he's going to be around. I was like, that's fine. And I did the like, you can't do this anymore because nobody reads newspapers. But I did the like snap of the newspaper. And I like looked over my shoulder at her like, mm -hmm. I'm going to not leave here for the rest of the day. So finally, he was in his office. Finally, she, I think he just wanted to go to lunch. And it was about three hours later, 
she said, he will see you now. And so I opened up the door to like the sanctum sanctorum and I like walk in and he takes a look at my letters of credential and my resume and he was like, are we going to be in National Geographic? <laughs> No, I don't think so. And then he was like, this is so fascinating. We talked for 30 minutes. He signs this letter and he gives me this printed letter and he said, have my secretary make copies of this for you and just carry it with you everywhere you go in the hospital. And so I had it with me at all times because of course you're a photographer in a hospital, people get a little freaked out. And it was the first time that I realized that a lot of the work that we do in humanitarian photography just requires getting the access. And sometimes the access takes longer than the actual shooting does. So I really fell in love with this place. My dad said, I, I totally thought you were gonna come home with like a baby because I just loved these children so much and I loved these nurses. They were so incredibly devoted. They were working with such limited resources. For example, in this photo, the next one, um, I don't have children, so I did not know. How many of you have children? Okay, so babies in the first, for those of you that don't have them, in the first six months, don't actually know how to swallow. They only know how to suck, like nursing. So that's why we have bottles that have little nipples on the top of them, but nipples can get very, very dirty. Their bacteria builds up in them, so you have to sterilize them in a very particular way. The sterilization process causes that plastic to crack, which causes you to have a lot of bottles that you have to go through and nipples that you have to go through, and so the hospital just couldn't afford it. So they would do what's called cup feeding, which is essentially taking the bottom part of the bottle, holding the baby, tipping the baby back, and pouring it down their throat. It is incredibly messy <laughs> and it takes a very long time and it's you know the only way that they can get these children to be able to eat when they've been abandoned at their doorstep. At the same time they would have to share incubators because they didn't have enough money and they would get used incubators from the other hospitals when they were passing out of expiration for the hospital so that they could just try to keep some of these children alive. And this is actually very good for the babies. They need touch, babies need touch. So they were all piled in together and um, they were allowed to kind of be and feel the warmth of other human beings because every three hours babies need to eat, which is amazing. You can totally set your clock by it. Within like two seconds, I'd be photographing like a quiet, sleepy ward. And then about one minute later, when we hit the three hour mark, all of them would start crying. <laughs> it would be so incredibly loud. And the mothers would come in for their lactation classes and then, the, the doctors would be trying to pour the baby's formula down their throat. And I was so impressed with this story and I, I loved doing it, I loved presenting it. I think that it's, it's such a small piece of humanitarian healthcare that people don't realize that sometimes these things happen in the cities where you are. I, I was fortunate enough to show this to the United Nations delegation in Kenya while I was there. And they said, the Director of Health and Human Services of of their group or the World Health Organization representative said, I had no idea that this was even going on in our town. We should probably get some funding for this. And I was like, yes, you probably should. <laughs> this is a really big deal. And I had a really difficult time with this strategically, like from the concept of, you know, the photojournalism package of a beginning, middle and end, it was very difficult. And um, I said to Stephen Morrison, who's a photographer based in East Africa, and I said, you know, I'm having I'm having such a hard time, like I can't really complete this package. And he said, Jamie, the only way to complete this story is to have somebody literally drop a baby off in front of you in the waiting room. And they're not gonna do that because you're standing there with a camera. <laughs> he said, it's just, what you did was you did it and you showed people it and you're going to keep showing it and you are going to be able to use this to prove to other people that you can actually do something like this on your own. And so my next tip for being a humanitarian photographer is become known as the fill in the blank of whatever you want your expertise or interest to be. I told anyone who would listen, I wanna cover healthcare. That's all I'm interested in, I just love healthcare. I cover politics as part of my day job and that's great and it pays the bills and I like it, but I want to cover healthcare. So I told anyone who would listen, I just want to cover healthcare. And I will never forget when this telephone call happened, I was photographing my friend, uh, Barbara Salisbury, who is a voice actor now here in New York. Uh, she's incredibly talented if you want to hire her, she's great. <laughs> but I was photographing her wedding in Greece I was on a pay phone and I was calling my boyfriend at the time, now husband, and he was uh, Steve McCurry's studio manager for a while. And he said, hey, I just caught wind of this really great call for proposals or call for portfolios uh, for this new organization. It's called the Global Fund. 
and it's certified by the World Health Organization, and they're looking for people who want to do humanitarian healthcare photography. And I totally think this is like, this is right up your alley. And I said, yes. And he said, get your butt back to the United States and apply for this. They're taking 12 photographers, and they're going to do a year-long documentation of their goals, which were to end AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. So I think it was like the Gates Foundation helped support it, and they said they thought that these are the three diseases we could actually eradicate if we put our energy and money into it. And so I did. I went back home, I pitched my portfolio, and I would say that the sub-lesson -le in this is never just apply for a grant or a project or something based on who else is necessarily applying or don't stop yourself. You know, if had I known who was applying for this, I totally would have like pumped the brakes. <laughs> Absolutely not. Because I sent my portfolio to the Global Fund in Geneva, and you had to send a print portfolio, so I had this like box of my prints, and they're all beautifully matted and branded and everything, it was nice. And actually, I got all of the mats here at BH, and um, I put it all together, I put it in the mail, and then when it came back, are you, are you guys familiar with the Agency 7? It's a photojournalism agency that was started at the time, um, James Noctway the incredible combat photographer started this agency with six other photographers and they called it seven and they were like the most amazing photographers in the world and i get this box back from like ups or whatever and i open it up and i was like this is not my portfolio <laughs> because it was in this beautifully branded seven box because they have like roman numerals are their thing and it's roman numerals seven and on the top of it it said one of seven and I was like, open it up. Nope, that's my portfolio. And I think they just got so many applications, they just started dumping people's stuff into whatever boxes. And had I known that all seven photographers were applying for this thing, I would have been like, I'm definitely not getting this. Um, but come to find out, I got a call two weeks later, and they said, we have chosen you to be a part of the team. There were 12 people. Magnum had offered up almost their entire roster of photographers at the time, so they chose six Magnum photographers and six unknown photographers like me. And um, the Magnum guys worked on doing documentation of tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria around the world for a traveling gallery show and book promotional fundraising. And pretty much the seven, the other six of us photographed for the annual reports and the brochures and things like that. And honestly, oozing competency sometimes, which is what I did, I just basically sent in everything that I had done that was medically related. And I wanted to show people I'm not afraid of surgery. I'm not afraid of being around sick people. I'm not afraid of any of this. And I have the competency to do it and I'm not gonna freak out. Um, so I got the job, it was great. What you're going to see is my portfolio from Uganda. What you will not see is my portfolio from Bolivia. <laughs> And the reason why is because I did something that I learned later in my first really big jump and leap into the humanitarian world was, we talk about this often at our workshops is, you need to run the nonprofit, do not let the nonprofit run you. Visuals are so incredibly different from the other things that people do when it comes to fundraising and content writing and web design and all of that. And so, I let the nonprofit run me. There was a writer who was there and he said, I heard about this clinic where there are 200 patients that's out in the middle of the jungle, let's go. So we went to Bolivia and we fly in and we spent a day and a half getting out to this clinic that was no lie. We show up, it is chained up with a padlock that's about this big and a spray painted closed sign across it. I was only in town for six days and I had just spent a day and a half going out into the middle of nowhere and then he said, well, there's a processing lab that we can go to. And we spent another day and a half going there and it was completely dead and it was awful. And I completely bombed this assignment. It was terrible. <laughs> it was very embarrassing. And I mean, I, I, I had content. I came back with it. It was fine. I think they used some of it in the annual report at some point, but oh, it was awful. And so Chris was still living here in New York and um, he Steve McCurry was one of the photographers who was chosen and he was at Steve's studio and he said, hey, you're coming up this weekend. Steve wants to go out for sushi. <laughs> Steve always wants to go out for sushi at the time and he, he wants to hear all about your, your global fund assignment because he just got back from Vietnam for doing his assignment. And I was like, oh God, why? And so we went and we sat down and we went to like over at the sushi place over in West Forth and said, started talking and he said, oh, Jamie, no, never go with the nonprofit find your own fixer, find your own driver,
come up with the schedule yourself. Do not let them be in control of how you're going to make those pictures. And he said, tell them you'll do it again. And I said, well, I am going back to Africa. And he was like, great, call them. Tell them you do anything they want. And so I did. And I basically called and begged in a professional way <laughs> to please give me another chance. And so they sent me to, uh, to cover their programs in Africa um, about HIV. So I worked with um, orphans, a lot of, I covered um, HIV and AIDS programs there. And I worked with children who were getting job training, who had lost their parents from, to HIV. I went and I worked at a orphanage where um, one mama, like this woman, would take in, I think it was five to 10 children in a house and she would agree to raise them as her kids. And so each house had uh, bunk beds and a house and, um, and we got to, I, I really, I loved the organizations that we worked with. They were incredible. Um, at the time, you know, HIV still had a huge stigma in Africa. People, you know, some people still thought you could get it by shaking hands or somebody, you know, was sick near you. You were definitely going to get sick and things like that. But one of the things that's so important about humanitarian photography, I think, is to make sure that it's not all just doom and gloom. I think um, the... As it's called, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are very interested in poverty porn, just this concept of looking at the sad, dirty, terrible situation and then clutching their pearls and not doing anything about it. And the fact of the matter is, is that, yes, some of the things that we cover are incredibly sad. And however, these two young, beautiful women have HIV AIDS in one of the poorest countries in Africa with one of the highest escalation rates of HIV AIDS. They are living with a stranger who's called their mother and yet they're still having a good time. And it doesn't all have to be sad. And if it is all sad, I think that's a lie. And I think that's where the ethics come in. Because no matter where you go, and I've been to some of the worst places the world ever has created, there are kids having a good time. There are teenagers finding a place to make out in secret so their parents can't catch them. There are couples who love each other and old people that hold hands in the park square. And, and it, it can be beautiful. Life is beautiful. And yet, at the same time, so many humanitarian photographers just focus on the sad. And I don't think that's necessary. I think that what we can do is we can really show that there's a balance. And part of what we teach at Momenta is hope versus need. You have to show that there's a need, obviously, because donors need to see that these children are living where there are dirt roads with running, you know, pestilent water going down the rivets on the side because when the monsoon season comes, they don't have anything other than floods and muddy roads to try to get to get these children to pick them up to go to school. And they need to know that, you know, the parents have to go and pick up these jerry cans, which weigh like so heavy, so heavy. I don't know if you guys ever saw when like Oprah did her thing where she adopted like 30 kids and made sure they were going to go to school or whatever and one of them was in like Cape Town I think and she put this like she put one of the you know jerry cans on her head like this little girl does every morning for like six hours and she couldn't even like walk two paces with it they're so heavy and you need to be able to show that for the nonprofit organization so they can say things like we need to build wells we need to figure out ways that we can get running water and sewage treatment centers and take the environmental factors that are impacting the clients that we have and make it better so that our programs can actually be more efficient. So this organization um, was really great. They would do home visits. They would go in and um, meet with the parents and make sure that their children were being taken care of, that their kids got medicine, um, that they had, they had the basic facilities that they needed. This woman is an angel who walks among us. She's one of my favorite background caption stories because she, and I'll just make a little aside here. Photojournalists have to come back with a caption. Mark Dolan used to drill into us and David Sutherland at Syracuse used to drill into us that you have to come back with a caption and if you don't have the name, age, town that the person lives in and a quote from that person, you had to go back and get it. And so I brought that into the humanitarian work that I did because I really wanted to know who are my subjects and what are they doing. And this woman was dating a guy he had a son right there. Uh, the son had HIV and one day she woke up in the middle of the night and he was gone. No note, no nothing. Cell phone was dead, couldn't find him anymore. And so she went into this, this center for this place called Jaja's Home and she said, I need some help because this told the situation. He basically abandoned his son with me and they're like, okay, you know, we'll get him into an orphanage and we'll figure this out. And she's like, oh, I'm sorry. No, he's my son now. 
I will make sure he's raised right. I just want to know how I'm supposed to give him his medicine so that he can survive. And I was like, wow, she's incredible. So she was raising him in a room that was approximately the size of maybe this area right here. It was a one room shack and she was making sure that he was fed, he had clean water and he got his HIV medicine. They would do work with child headed households. Um, and part of that work, you know, when I was out, I was photographing specifically for the HIV part of it, but their other mission was malaria. And if you look, I mean, if there isn't malaria in the cesspool of running sewer that's going out in front of their house, I would be incredibly surprised. So I saw this and I knew that they might need something that was related to malaria. And in fact, the baby was having such terrible bug bites that they were using this home remedy of putting like mud so it would kind of cake on the skin and keep the bugs away. And I knew that would be a really important part of the mission that they needed to describe. This is not necessarily one of my life lessons, it's just like a tip. I highly recommend if you're going to do any kind of humanitarian and, and work, in general probably, any kind of work outside, uh, get yourself a really good pair of boots, like heavy leather boots. I have Danners, I recommend those. They're lumberjack boots, they come up to about here. <laughs> and um, Because when I was taking this photo, I, I popped out of the van and we walked in and this woman was raising pigs to feed her grandchildren because she had eight of her grandchildren living in the house because all of her children had died of HIV. And I walked up and there was approximately, I don't know, like a foot of just raw pig awful in the ground and I had my big old boots on which make me invincible and I just plopped right up and meanwhile she's walking around barefoot and the other tip that I would give you is learn a handful of phrases in the native language of wherever you are not hello how are you of course everybody should know that I learned how to say in Lugandan I think you look beautiful <laughs> because I would go and meet people like this and they'd be like oh I don't want to be photographed and then I would just say in Lugandan well, I think you look beautiful. And I said this to this woman, she starts cracking up. I literally picked up my camera, took like five shots, and then we had to go. And uh, I, I love that picture. She's so full of joy and happiness, even though she could be incredibly sad. So I, my, my time in Uganda with the Global Fund was great. And this is really when I started to pivot from doing mainly photojournalism to humanitarian work almost entirely. And because of that, my life lesson is always go to the bar. <laughs> Even if you don't drink, just go. My stepmother was one of the first female executives in a Fortune 500 company. And um, if you guys have ever seen like Mad Men, think about the women in the show who were the actual ones who were trying to climb that ladder. <laughs> and she said, I would go to the bar. I would just order a, this is like another tip for you guys, order a club soda with a little splash of cranberry and a little lime and everybody thinks that you're having a cocktail but you are making sure that you are not going to be that you know drunk idiot at the bar and so if you don't go to the if you don't want to drink fine go to the bar anyway because it's where the networking happens it's where people start talking and one night I went to the bar and because I was that medical photographer Lo and behold, who shows up, but the director of Doctors Without Borders of East Africa is hanging out with the guys from the BBC. I knew them because I had let them use the Wi-Fi at my hotel one day when theirs wasn't working, which was like one of the coolest experiences of my life because I sat in my hotel room while they were broadcasting about the Ugandan presidential elections and I just got to sit and listen, like front row. And they're like, yes, this is so-and-so reporting from Kampala. I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it took everything I had not to like squee. Um, but they said, hey, Jamie, you've got to come over. You've got to meet this guy. He's the director of Doctors Without Borders of East Africa. And I was like, are you serious? So I plopped down. And he's like, yeah, you want to go somewhere, anywhere? Like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'd love to go photograph. And at the time, the war was going on in northern Uganda. And I said, you know, I'd, I'd love to go up north. And he's like, sure, we'll fly you in. We'll drop you off. No big deal. I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, but we just need an exchange of like, you know, this. And we, we kind of talked out all the details. He's like, we'll put you out for a week. We'll house you. We'll fly you in. We'll fly you out. It's great. One of my most embarrassing stories of all of my career happened on that plane, full of doctors with Doctors Without Borders. And I got crazy airsick. And <laughs> it was incredibly embarrassing. And they let me go out there. I, I got the story. I sent it to them. It was used on their website. It was, it was awesome. Um, and years later, the White House News Photographers Association had this grant. 
this $5,000 project grant. And I was super intimidated to apply for it because if you know who's in WHNPA, they're like Pulitzer Prize winners and Michael Williamson and Amy Vitale and all these people. And I was like, I don't I'd never do that. And they're like, Jamie, no one ever applies for this grant. We get maybe five applications. I was like, are you serious? I like those odds. I could do that. Okay. And so I did. I applied to go. And when I made my application, I was going to go back because the war had stopped in northern Uganda. And I was going to go photograph the MSF clinic there. And um, it was going to be awesome. Except three days approximately before it was set to go, war broke out in Congo. They completely emptied the center. There were no doctors. They all crossed over the border, which was being guarded by the blue helmets and making sure that no one else crossed the border, including idiot intrepid journalists. I went to the border. I tried. It did not work out. Um, but I, I was in country. I had a grant. I had layer caked my funding, which we'll talk about a little bit more. I was already on assignment um, in Uganda covering something else. And then I was teaching a workshop. And then I was going to do my grant project. And I only had like a week left to do it. And I didn't know what to do. And I was like, oh my god, they're going to ask for this money back. <laughs> And I've already spent this money, and I don't know what to do. So I put into practice a journalism truth, which is ask for forgiveness, not permission. And so many times when I'm writing proposals or even talking to prospective clients, I just always write like I already have the job. So I just wrote, hey, guys, just letting you know, not asking for permission, just letting you know the clinic closed down for Doctors Without Borders while I was here, but I'm going to go photograph another organization in the same town-ish there. And I had made some other friends, and I found out about this group called TASO, which is the AIDS support organization. And I said, I'd like to go up to Gulu. What you got going on up there? And he said, uh, well, we have a center that you can go to, but no one's ever photographed our pediatrics program, and we'd really love it if you could photograph the pediatrics. And I said, sure, I don't care. You could have said, you want me to do still lifes, and I would do it. <laughs> and so I went, and um, it was a huge facility. There were about 2,000 patients, and Gulu's a very tiny town. Like, it's not big. But there are patients coming in from all around the country, and they do prick tests, which are just like tiny little pin needles where you put blood on these particular uh, sensitive pieces of paper, and it tells you if the child is um, needs to go in for further testing. And they do this all day long. It, they come in, they go out, they come in, they go out. It happens constantly. And and the guy who does it is actually the nicest man. Like he's this big like roly-poly, cuts like huge smile, big face. He's like the sweetest human being. And these kids cry bloody murder when they get this like tiny little pin break. They just start bawling and screaming. And I, and I did audio because I was doing a multimedia project cuz I figured why not. And I have audio of him during this one particularly very very loud child had finally left and you could hear me giggle and say you're a very mean man and he, and he responds every single day all day long it's like this <laughs> and he was like but i you know i love it and i love them and he wanted to help them and so i was working on this particular project and I knew it was for the grant, but I also knew I might want to use it for fundraising later. So I did, some people asked me like, why did you shoot black and white? This is the first black and white. I do black and white and color. Um, and this one just felt right in black and white. But the children are, they were obviously, they had a very difficult time <laughs> with uh, what was happening. But moreover, there's a lot of problems in that particular region because it's very poor. There's not a lot of electricity at the time. There is not a lot of support for them. And much of the medicine at the time needed to be refrigerated, which is almost impossible. So then people would have to be coming in every single day to get their medical treatments. And a lot of the, what they wanted me to cover was mother to child transmission rates. So if you don't know, um, when, you, when you are becoming that person, when you're becoming that expert, I had to learn a ton about HIV AIDS that I didn't know before. But one of the things that makes you a really good humanitarian photographer, I think, is if you know the issue of the mission of your organization. And I started to learn a whole bunch of stuff. Like I knew how many doses of Nevarapin kids needed before you know, the first day they were born, like all of it, because you have to be able to look for those things. And so it's so important to try to find the human stories that are behind a lot of the issues and make them, you know, a little bit more straightforward. This woman was incredible. She was the only pediatric nurse in the entire northern Uganda area. And she had 2,000 child, or yeah, I guess she had 2,000 pediatric patients that she dealt with. No pediatric doctors, surgeons, anything like that. They would have to put a kid on a bus to go to Kampala if they needed anything more than what she could do. And she was the happiest lady ever. Like, she was so incredibly sweet. Mom is a shrink, and she 
has uh, been, she's done a lot of drug and alcohol counseling, which has been very interesting in the last, you know, many several years with this opioid addiction crisis because she had so much experience with that early on. And this organization did a lot of counseling and a lot of work with the families of the children, especially, to try to get them over this problem of, you know, being stigmatized and dealing with that. And so whenever I found groups that, you know, have any sort of healthcare related mental health support, I, I think it's really incredible. So I, I spend a little bit of time with them. I think that, you know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. I told them, I need a baby being born. Somebody give me a baby being born. And so they had my pager. Yeah, because it's like back in the dark ages, like 2006 or whatever. I think I had a pager. Either way, I had a cell phone and a pager. And they said, okay, we'll absolutely call you because this lady is like literally ready to pop. She's going to go into labor. And sure enough, I show up in the clinic the next morning and they're like, Jamie, I can't wait for you to meet the baby that was born last night. And I was like, I, I told you to call me at any time. And they're like, oh, but it was so late. You were sleeping. And I was like, I have to leave in two days, <laughs> and uh, but I did meet the baby, and uh, it was it was good. They needed a shot of a newborn baby getting his first dose of nevirapine. These babies are twins. One of them has HIV, and one of them was born without, and they don't know why. They would have a daycare so that even if the children weren't part of the pediatric center, they could just come and spend time at the daycare. They could get a meal, at least one meal every day there. This was their computer system. Um, so part of, you know, this doesn't really have anything to do specifically with the pediatrics program, but I wanted to be able to have them show that they need money for computers. They need money to be able to take these files that they're using, paper files. And what you can't see is behind me, they're stacked up floor to ceiling in boxes and boxes and boxes. And so, for those of you who've been on a Momenta workshop, we have this core lecture that um, Chris Anderson, my co-founder, has about seven elements of composition and seven elements of a photo story. And, you know, the seven elements of a photo story are like portrait, detail, wide angle, telephoto. I'm being quizzed right now. Crap. <laughs> moment. Um, and I realized I, I always carried that piece of paper with me in my donkey camera bag and I would pull it out at the end of every night and I would sit down with my notebook and I would make sure that I had all of my seven elements of composition. I really wanted to make certain that I had that and I realized right the day that I was leaving, oh my god, I don't have any portraits <laughs> at all of this place. And so I met this lovely, lovely young woman who um, agreed to sit for a portrait with me. And does anyone have any questions? I feel like I should ask that. I think I probably did tell her that she was beautiful in Lugandan. <laughs> so everyone has pivot points in their life. Uh, my stepmother, as I previously said, was this, you know, like jet setting executive who had all of this like amazing power and was traveling all over the world. And then she met this guy with these two annoying mouthy daughters who lived in Northern Ohio. And she said, maybe I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. Now, of course, when I was growing up, you know, she had like the Pan Am um, briefcase that they gave you when you were flying business class on Pan Am. And I was like, that's so cool. Why would you ever stay in Ohio? <laughs> Like, you should have been doing that. And she was like, because I wanted to be there to raise you guys. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, my life was more fulfilled rather than just getting on planes all the time, being with you and going to your, you know, terrible piano recitals and, <laughs> and your school plays and your field hockey games and all of that. And so I think one of the, the issues that a lot of people kind of think about when it comes to pivot points is when am I going to do the thing that I really want to do versus the thing that's making me a lot of money? And as we've kind of moved into this, I think, realm of understanding how we are and self-care and all of these funny buzzwords that we have right now, really it's about checking in. And a lot of people don't do that. A lot of companies don't do that. A lot of small businesses, like you know, photographers, don't sit back and say, like, am I still doing what I really want to do? Do I still love what I'm doing right now? And the answer sometimes is no, or sometimes it's yes, but. And I was at a yes, but time in my life. I, I was transitioning, you know, I had almost completely stopped doing photojournalism. And I was doing a lot more humanitarian work and I still liked it, but I had been asked to do a little bit of teaching and I really liked teaching and I thought that was interesting, but I didn't really know what to do. And then my boyfriend, now husband, uh, Chris said, 
we're thinking about starting this business and it's called Momenta and this is what we're going to be doing. And there was another photographer, Seth, that was working with him at the beginning and said, you know, would you like to come on and maybe do like a humanitarian photo workshop? And I said, yes, but I want to do it entirely differently from the way that everyone else has been doing it. It has to be different because the way everyone else is doing it is just so bass backwards. I can't handle it. And we've got to do it this way. And they said, you can do whatever you want, which is very rare in the world of jobs. I think when somebody says, just go with God, have fun, make it profitable or whatever. And I said, okay. And I, I said, here's what I want to do. Let's do our first one. And then we're going to do this one. And then I think we could expand it because I feel like people don't have a lot of business skills. And they were like, whoa seriously rein it in for like one minute and let's see if anybody actually wants to go <laughs> so we did our first workshop in Uganda because um, I had my expertise there and it was incredibly successful we had 13 photographers they worked with 16 different nonprofit organizations um, we had an amazing time we had such success we started the next workshop um, you know six months later to go back to Uganda and the work that you're about to see is the work of the photographers who come on our trips these are no longer my images so the great thing about finding your soul as you keep rediscovering what it is that you really love and what you're really interested in especially in this type of work is to I realized after the first year I really love doing this I Never would have thought that, you know, figuring out business plans and logistics plans and coming up with curriculum, writing whole, you know, lecture series and, and writing handbooks and trying to explain to people like, how do you use photo mechanic? And you don't understand? Damn it, I have to rewrite the book now because you don't understand what I'm saying. And how do we come up with captioning information, global captioning information for our workshops? And it was incredible. We had photographers from all around the world. This is uh, Laura Morgan from Scotland. This is Carla from uh, Brazil. South Africa. Um, he's, he's Swiss. So I think that the important part of project development in terms of humanitarian photography, especially when you're looking at how you want to develop a project or even how you want to develop your career, is find people who can help you with your weaknesses. For anybody who knows me, math is not my strong suit. <laughs> I really shouldn't even be allowed to log my expenses in QuickBooks because <laughs> I can barely add. That's not true. I'm fine with it. It just takes me about three weeks to do what takes somebody else three hours. So we needed a bookkeeper. You know, we need people who can think strategically. We, we kind of had this phrase at the beginning of the company, which was there are three of us who were helping to start it. And Chris was the head. Chris is the brain. He is the one who had the architectural mindset. He envisioned Wildfire Media 11 and a half years ago when we hadn't even started the first division of workshops. He was the one who strategically started it. He knew that. However, I was the heart, like I'm nicknamed the fun machine in workshops because I was like, this is going to be great. I love everything. I am so excited about this. Let's do this. Let's expand. Let's find this way to empower people and let's get more women involved and more people of color and more people from other countries. And how can we start scholarship programs and all of that? And, and we needed each other because that's how, you know, your partnerships and your weaknesses can go. And then we had, you know, Seth, who was this, this soul. He was our Buddhist. He was the one who taught us mindfulness. And he was the one who made sure that we felt like, you know, we were making the impact that we wanted on the world. Because at the time, Chris had been working, you know, for National Geographic. And he had been brought up here to New York to work at AOL's headquarters for their news division. And... I was working, you know, with these amazing organizations like the Global Fund and I and, you know, Seth had been consulting for Magnum photographers to build their curriculum for their workshop programs. And we knew that if we were going to do this, we wanted to do it with something that we really believed in and something that meant something to us. So when we created this program, we brought people in who also believed in what we believed in and people who were really passionate about creating work with nonprofits. So all of this is coming from our nonprofit workshops with so these photographing nonprofits. This photographer is amazing. His name's Christian Bobst. Um, he like came and learned photography, you know, at one of our very first workshops and just a couple of years later won a World Press Award. <laughs> just, you know, as you do. Uh, this is Alison Zwaka. She's 
awesome. She's based in Los Angeles. And Allison is now teaching for our program. Because a lot of what happens in our workshops is we meet people who are really, really talented. And we say, like, gosh, we would, you're great. And one of the things that was a core principle of ours is that we didn't want to create a company of acolytes. This isn't some weird cult where you like lay at the foot of the master and then you get verbally berated all day long and told that your pictures are garbage and lens caps get thrown at your head and all of those things are exactly, I'm not exaggerating what happened at some people's master classes. And instead we wanted people who were really good teachers and who really believed in our mission and made it their mission as well. And Allison was one of them. This is Uday's, and I'm not even going to try to say Uday's last name because I will totally butcher it, but Uday's so talented, and he is, he came to Columbia with us, and he actually, one of his images from that work was featured in Social Documentary Network's 10-year anniversary gallery show down, right down here in, in New York. Um, so I think that part of what we do and part of the mission that we do has expanded the the part of my career that really was missing. I wanted more and more and more people doing this. And Chris's idea was to create, you know, the esprit de corps that we didn't have anymore in journalism because I don't know if you guys know this, but like the newspaper industry is not doing very well. <laughs> and when that happened, all of us in that community didn't have anyone to talk to anymore. We didn't have the ability to be in a newsroom and go and say like, I've never photographed at the White House before. What is that like? Or what am I supposed to wear when I go out doing, you know, skeet shooting or something like that? And so we were able to come together and start bringing larger communities together. And it started with just 30 people and then 60 people. And now we have more than 800 alumni from our programs. I know, right? It's crazy. And. <laughs> And we have instructors who are now teachers and, and working photographers. This is Charlotte Kessel's image from our, our very first Katrina. It was called Project Katrina at the time, um, but now it's Project New Orleans. And Charlotte now works for the New York Times and the Washington Post, and she's just she's blowing up all over the place. She's based in Florida. This is Chuck Cecils, who was a retired ambassador who just really wanted to be able to leave his work in public service and use his photography and his experience to, to empower other people. And he, he makes gorgeous work. This is Ava Russo, who came as a student. She was a photographer uh, at the Richmond Times Dispatch, three-time Pulitzer nominee, and she came on this workshop and we loved her work so much we brought her back as a mentor and now she is an instructor and she's in she's incredible so i think that if we really understand that collaboration is key and and we get that we're stronger together anyone who stood up here on the stage or in any of the presentations you've seen I, they'd be lying if they said they got here by them by themselves because you really do need other people that you can rely on and if nothing else you need other people who will call you and say I just found this grant and I think it's gonna be perfect for you and we need to figure out a way to work together a little bit more I think uh, compromise and collaboration and all those fun C words are not heard a lot in today's environment unfortunately and we have so much more in common than we do apart in so many different ways and so I think that if we cannot focus on our differences and find ways to collaborate and find ways not to you know let's be honest stab each other in the back that happens a lot in this industry which makes no sense to me um, then we can actually find a way to create beautiful images like this all around the world letting other people who don't have the ability to travel and see them see our work and know the importance of the humanitarian photography that's being done and the humanitarian works that are being done by the people that we photograph and the nonprofit organizations that are out there trying to make a difference. And we get to photograph, you know, really fun, happy stuff <laughs> that whenever I get to see it in our archive it just makes me happy and makes me remember that like there is good in the world and it's pretty great. So um, I, I'm a huge podcast fan. I listen to podcasts all the time and uh, I listen to, I, I really like How I Built This with Guy Raz, um, and it's a show about, on NPR, about, you know, how people built their companies. And Stacey Matson um, is from Stacey's Pita Chips, and she started out very early on with her husband out of like a food cart in the middle of Harvard Square, I think, and she made this great um, statement of just surround yourself with believers. And I said, I just want to 
blow this up and put this above my desk because it's so important when you're doing work like this to have people who really support you and who believe in what you're doing and they want to help make photographs with you and make those pictures be seen and expand the work that you're doing. And at the same time, you know, as you're, as you're building your business and as you're building your portfolio to do humanitarian work, I think it's really important to work with those people who inspire you and also who believe in you and finding the right people who inspire you and keep you going and fulfill all of your, you know, buttons that you need so that you can go forth and make great pictures like this. This is Uday's picture that was in the gallery show. If you guys, we're, we're gonna get to the end where we talk a little bit more about some of these practical things um, about how to do this. And as Social Documentary Network is definitely one of them. It's such an amazing, amazing conglomerate and collection of photographers who are doing such incredible work. And I'll say this, I love my job, I really do. I'm, I do not regret putting my camera down at all. I still shoot. You know, people act like I got some sort of like, you know, I went blind or something when I went behind a desk. Like, do you still take photographs? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. I travel all over the world teaching workshops. Like, I, I make photos. I just make them for me now, and it feels great. And I, I get way more out of being able to watch other people make those pictures. And honestly, I mean, I get to work with my husband, which, let's be real, it's not always great. <laughs> But at the same time, I get to be with somebody who makes me laugh like this on a daily basis. And um, I get to know that we're building something together and it's ours and it brings in people who will come from Seattle to see something <laughs> you've already seen my work before and, and be a part of the larger community that we have. And community is so important to us at Momenta. We, we went through our 10 year anniversary and we rebranded we went over our brand messaging again and our brand essence, we had to reevaluate a little bit and we came up with community because that really is what Momenta has done, I believe, and what we aspire to do. So let's talk for just a couple of minutes about, you know, is humanitarian photography a good fit for you? It's not easy. <laughs> It's very difficult. It's not glamorous at all. There are certain times where you're just, you know, you're thinking to yourself, do I have dysentery or is this just gas? <laughs> You're thinking, I just want to go home. It's almost Christmas. The only other time that I ever cried on assignment was thanks to my father because I was two days out, it was December 23rd and I was photographing for the Global Fund and they were having a Christmas party and I was so tired, I was so dehydrated. Ebola had just broken out in Congo. I mean, I just really wanted to go home and they played my dad's like favorite Christmas song at the time, which is that one by Boney M, the, the Mary's boy child. And it comes on and like the Santa came in and he's in this just moth ridden Santa suit. And these kids are so excited and they're like screaming and I just started bawling. I was like, I just wanna go home and I wanna see my parents. And then I had to walk out. I was like, I'm sorry, I have something in my contact. I, do, I don't wear contacts. <laughs> and I walked outside into an alley and I, I cried for like five minutes. And then I was like, get your shit together. You're a journalist. Do your job. And I was like, okay. And I went in and I finished my job. And then I basically got on a plane and went home and felt, <laughs> felt much better to be able to see my family. So it's not always glamorous. It can actually be really hard. Um, a lot, of the, a lot of the most frequently asked questions we get is, you know, should you volunteer for a nonprofit first? I think this is a tricky situation because there's, go ahead, just Google that question and see all of the ranters out there that are like, absolutely not, you're taking money away from paying photographers. Not necessarily. Yes, if you go and you volunteer for the Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders or some organization like that that can really afford to pay you and they found out that they got a freebie, no one in their right, no nonprofit in their right mind is gonna say no to a free photographer. But what you should be doing is finding those lower underfunded organizations that, you know, if they have a budget of less than a million dollars a year, let's say, they can't afford to pay a $10,000 documentary photographer. In fact, they will probably roll out the red carpet and be so excited to have a photographer come in to help them get to that, that, that next level. So, you know, people ask like, well, I want to retire into nonprofit photography, which I think is great. I think that's a, a wonderful thing to do with this passion that you have. 
And right outside of these doors, B&H sells a number of cameras that I'm sure they would love you to have to take on those assignments. <laughs> but if you want to do that, it, it's wonderful, but you're still having to buy the cameras. You still need a computer. You still need a cell phone. You still need to you know, pay bills and things like that. And so I think volunteering is fine. I volunteered early on to make photos in exchange for access just to build my portfolio. But you have to realize when you hit that threshold, like. Most of the time you reach that threshold just because people are taking advantage of your time and they're like, hey, can you come in and do headshots of the entire organization, all 300 people? And you're like, what? No. And could you bring lights too? And you're like, I don't have lights. So I think that that's not necessarily what you're wanting to do if you get to like that point and you realize, yes, I will absolutely do that. Pay me. If not, you should have in that collaboration Rolodex of yours. They don't have those anymore, do they? What do we call those? You're like, your cell phone, okay, there you go. Go to your cell phone, type in photographer, and see who's up there that you can recommend. And you have to get to that point where your business skills come up a little bit too. So I, I know that photographers you know, say like, nobody told me there would be math. <laughs> nobody told me there would be accounting and business and all of that other important stuff. It, you probably do need a training program versus going it alone. I think um, you know, a lot of people will come to me and say like, I did this volunteer project in you know, Botswana and I spent $5,000 and I maxed out a credit card. and. I don't really know what to do with my portfolio now, and, is that, and that's fine. That's how a lot of us started out. But when there are programs out there like Momenta, there's programs out there like ICP that does you know different kinds of training, business programs, things like that. Like take advantage of all of those so that you can really learn the right way to volunteer. Or if you're going to try to do it alone, doing those personal projects by yourself is uh, pretty pretty difficult, I think, um, without having some sort of mentorship or guidance. And then, do nonprofits make good clients? I always love that question. Because, I, I mean, maybe? Ness? <laughs> like, yeah, some of them are. Some of them are the worst clients I've ever had. I mean, I had somebody, I had an assignment where I had to out of pocket pay $6,000 in expenses, and it took nine months to be reimbursed for it. At the time, I did not have $6,000 just sitting around. And finally, I got so angry when they kept putting me off that um, I, told them I was going to charge them the interest rates and I should have had that in the contract. It was a great learning lesson and they that's when they finally realized how much interest I was paying on my credit card for those things and that's why they're not always the greatest clients in the world. I think sometimes they can be a little difficult but some of them are wonderful. So it's really a balance. I don't think there's a yes or no answer to that. Should you write grants for your projects? Um, yes, always. I think everyone should write grants. It's, there's so much free money out there. Like. If you were standing on the street corner and instead of the guy trying to give you Subway, you know, Subway sandwich coupons that's outside right now, it was like, hey, can I just give you $10,000? What I'm going to need from you is you to write like 10,000 words of a proposal and then I'll just give you $10,000. That seems like a really great deal. I don't know why everyone isn't taking advantage of it. And there are so many foundations that like literally don't, don't meet their giving goals because people either aren't applying for them or they're not applying with the right projects. So yes. You absolutely should be writing grants and you should be looking into those type of awards. Now, photographers, unfortunately, always go to like the same ones, right? Like, does anybody know a photo grant that's available in the world right now? Throw out anything, no? Yes? How about the Getty grant, right? The most competitive, like one of the most competitive grants out there. The, the Leica Women Photo Grant that just came out. Within like literally 20 minutes of that grant coming out, I had at least 10 alumni from our program saying, would you help me edit my portfolio to this? They got 675 applications, I believe, for this one grant. Everyone knew about that grant. So don't go after that grant. Go after the ones that no one's ever heard of. Do the White House news photographers ones. Call the grant committee, especially if it's an established grant, and just say, how many people applied last year? They'll, they'll tell you. They'll probably talk to you for a while about it. You can ask them, is my project appropriate for that? But if you're going to do that, here's a couple of other lessons I would say. Lean into your most brutally honest critics. Nobody likes to be told that your butt looks big in those jeans. But maybe your butt looks big in those jeans, and you shouldn't buy them. <laughs> No one wants to be told, uh, this is not working. I don't understand. The thing that I love about my stepmother, she's the most honest critiquer I have probably ever met. She will tell you point blank, that doesn't make any sense. You're using way too big words. This is way too long. This is whatever. I mean, she, was, she very honestly told me when my very first website came out, and I was super proud of it, and I had this really cutesy headshot. <laughs> 
you remember this? I did. It was like me, and I'm all smiling. And I was like, I got a telephone call. What in God's name is on your About Me page? <laughs> and I was like, what? I love that photo. And she was like, you look like a dingbat. Take that off and get a professional headshot. And, and she was totally right. Like 20 years later, she was 100% right. I did. I looked like a complete dingbat. I wouldn't have trusted me with $10,000 in grant money. So find those people who are your most brutal critics. And make sure that when you are striving to not just prove them wrong. You know, Chris has this great phrase that I love, which is, you know, Mediocrity is the norm, excellence is the exception. With the understanding that be the latter. Try to go above and beyond what everyone else is doing. I will tell you I got into Syracuse, I don't know how. I mean, I do know how because they told me. I was not a good photographer, my portfolio was awful, but I hand bound my portfolio. <laughs> I wanted to get in so badly, I hand bound it. I custom created my own brand for my captions and everything like that. And like, it was really competitive to get into the grad program. And all the portfolios were out there and David Sutherland and Mark Dolan so were talking and the other people and Mark picked up my portfolio was like, I think we should talk about this candidate. And everyone else said, really? <laughs> and he was like, look at this portfolio. She really wants to get in here. And and. David was perfectly honest with me. He's like, you're gonna have to work harder than everybody else in your class. And I knew that and I understood that and I wanted to be better than everyone else in my class. And so try to be the exception, try to be the excellent one. Um, one of the best pieces of advice my mom ever gave me was I, I was in Israel and there was a bus bombing that I had photographed and I had never seen anything like that before. And I, I went out to go cover the spot news and I called her afterwards and I said, Oh, I just I, I need to talk to Shrink Mom whenever I want to call her up, and I need her to like talk to me like a psychologist, not my mom. I'd be like, is Shrink Mom available? She's like, yeah, what's up? And I told her, and she said, okay. And I said, I, I think I need to go. I just have to go get a drink. It was like 11 a.m. And she said, no, whatever you do, do not get an alcoholic beverage right now. Go get some tea or something like that. And just don't drink because that's going to become your coping mechanism for trauma that you see moving forward. And that was great advice. And she said, you have to remember that this is happening to you too. You didn't just go and witness a bus bombing. This is part of now your, your mental scars that you will live with for the rest of your life. And it's so important right now that we understand the self-care in the photography world, especially in humanitarian photography. It's very traumatic to see some of the things that we see. And it's very difficult for people to be able to talk about it, but we are talking about it a lot more, and I think that that's so great. I think that's what our community exists for, is to be able to lean on each other. I always think that in, in journalism and in humanitarian photography, go where no one else is going. If you find out that everybody is doing Syria or Hong Kong or whatever they're covering right now, go to Siberia. Go to Kitty Cuck, Iowa and see what's going on there. Go anywhere that everyone else isn't going because it will help you stand out. It will help you stand out to grant committees. They want to see things they haven't seen. I was just talking with somebody who was judging a contest. She was judging all these grants for um, a very well-known grant association. And she, she's like, it sounds really brutal. I'm sorry, but oh my God, if I have to see another Rohingya portfolio, I'm going to jump off a bridge. And I said, is, is the Rohingya one going to win? She's like, maybe, I don't know. We're all just getting so burned out with this like latest round because there's just so many of them. And she said, but there are a couple of really standout ones from you know, Guatemala or whatever that are, that are really good. And I think they're probably, they're probably in the leanings. There's a couple in the United States that are really cool. Like everybody's trying to go to all of those places. So if you can figure out a way to go somewhere else or do something a little bit differently and you become that expert, that's going to be really great for you. Cultivate your network carefully and respect their attention. I think this is a really important part of what we're doing these days. We all have a network, right? You've got that cell phone that's got your entire catalog of everyone you've ever met probably in the entire world. And then we all have Facebook of a whole, like how, how many people know every single person face to face that you are friends with on social media? <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> no, you don't. But that network can work for you or it can work against you. This will be like my one social media tip when it comes to humanitarian photography especially. I can't tell you how many times I have been so outraged at what I've seen or so angry or sat in hearings where I've heard things that people would say or questions that ignorant people would ask. And the first thing I wanted to do was just walk out of the room and shout to anyone who would listen how horrified, angry, pissed off, whatever I was. 
And that's exactly what social media allows us to do, unfortunately. Because I do not think that if you really want to be successful in this, in this particular industry especially, that if having your inner monologue as your outer monologue on your Twitter feed is a good idea. In general, I think that that's just a great tip for social media. But your donors and the people who are giving you grants will see that. And they will not be pleased if they see you c complaining all the time. You're yelling, you're being angry, you're super opinionated. They might even question your balance and your, not your mental balance, I mean some people, yes. <laughs> I definitely have people on my Facebook feed that I question their mental balance. But you need to respect their attention so that if they're paying attention to you, they know what it is that you want them to pay attention to. So being strategic about social media, I think, is really important. Um, establishing your competency is, is very important as well. Like when you can, be cultivating that LinkedIn profile. I know, photographers love Instagram. You know who likes LinkedIn? Editors marketing directors, people who are in charge of donor engagement. They all love LinkedIn. So it's cool if you want to try to network yourself only to nonprofit ph or photographers out there. Great, cool. I love talking to other photographers. It's awesome and empowering. And I like looking at your Instagram feeds and all that good stuff. But if I want to talk to people who actually have the money to fund the projects that we want or the people who are out there who are looking to do the kind of work that we're doing, I'm going to the source of that funding is. And so making sure that you actually put on your LinkedIn profile that you have this kind of experience, that you do whatever it is that you've been doing, the awards that you've won, the places where you volunteer, you know, anything that would make you attractive to an organization would be great. Uh, so if any of you have seen the television show The Good Place, <laughs> it's about a whole bunch of people who end up in heaven and you can't curse in heaven. So, so they say things like bullshit and, <laughs> and ego is, totally inappropriate in this industry. I think that the people who run around and are constantly talking about how great they are and all the great things that they're doing are either looking for collaborators or just looking to try to make you feel little. And after a while, everybody, you all have that photographer that you muted on social media that you're like, I just can't, I can't listen to you anymore. And the humble brags are just too much. But they could be the things that are like, hey, I want to collaborate with people. Hey, I'm going to be speaking at B&H. Please come out so I can see people that I know in the audience or not. Or come out and see me so, you know, it would be great. And so it's good to get you that ego out there to let people know that you are excited about it. But try to find that nice fine line between being a total jerk and between being, you know, enthusiastic about what you're doing. And <laughs> please remember that your job is not 100% awesome all of the time. <laughs> This is um, this, this photographer's name is Chip Salmadavia. He is a Getty photographer. He's like White House Photographer of the Year a bunch of times, and he's just incredibly talented. And I honestly, I do not know who took this photo. I'm a little sad. I cannot give credit to it because I can't remember who took it. But it's one of my favorites because, yes, this is the glamorous life of a political photographer sometimes. I think that um, learn from those who came before you. My favorite question to ask anyone who's done a successful grant proposal or a successful crowdfunding campaign is, what's the biggest mistake you made when you did your project? Because you can learn so much more from their mistakes probably than you can from their successes. And when I first started doing our Get Funded workshop um, and the Marketing for Photographers workshop, I was talking about crowdfunding, this new and exciting thing that you could do to ask your friends for money. <laughs> And now, like, everyone's doing it, you know. I heard about somebody recently who's trying to fundraise the down payment for their house. <laughs> yeah, right. I was like, oh, we can do that now? Fantastic. I definitely don't want to pay a down payment anymore. So I think that if you can learn from those people who came before you and figure out that kind of a way that you can use what they've been doing, including now there's so many books out there about crowdfunding and grant writing and... One of those really incredible books you'll see a little bit, little bit later is John Harrington's Best Business Practices for Photographers. It is the Bible. It is longer than the Bible. <laughs> it's longer than four Bibles right now. It is a textbook of how to be a successful business, sole business proprietor. And John has this great expression, professional gear for professional people. I think that also includes a lot of the pitching that goes on with like your projects and what you want to be doing in your networking. If you, you know, if you walk up to somebody and you say like, yeah, I've, I'm a professional photographer and they're like, do you have a website? No, I have an Instagram account. Like, 
my friend's dog has an Instagram account. Like, I don't think that makes you necessarily a professional. I want to see a website. I want to see a website that shows me your competency. It shows me the thing, the grants that you won or the grants that you haven't won. And that part of that professional gear is prioritizing. I had a student photographer one time come in for a portfolio review at the Northern Short Course. If you're not familiar with that, I highly recommend the program. It's great. Um, then they have free portfolio reviews every night, so you can sign up for at least two. And she showed up, and she had the most glossy, gorgeous, beautiful, like, you know, what is it, like 25-inch MacBook Pro, whatever. And I looked at her camera that she plunked on the table, and she had, like, a... I don't know, like a Canon Rebel X-T1 of like six generations back with like a lens that only went from like F4 to whatever, which is totally fine. It was the kit lens that came with the camera. It's totally fine if you're not making your living at this. And I said to her, is this a school computer, just curiosity wise? And she's like, no, I just bought it. Isn't it amazing? And I just for giggles, I went up to the about this Apple. She had the full package, the extended memory, everything, whatever. And I was like, so this thing probably cost you like after I looked at her portfolio, which she was shooting this whole thing at night, and I don't know if you guys know, but like the kit lenses at four at night shooting documentary coverage of stuff was not working for her. And I said, so you just went out and you budgeted thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars and you don't have an F2.8 lens? Like, this is not a priority set that we should be talking about. We need professional gear to go out and do the professional things that you want to do. So get yourself an old computer. Buy yourself that, you know, your, your parents, you know, old laptop or whatever, and put your money into the gear that's going to make you more money so that you can actually do that. Um, there are whole classes on grant writing. We do a whole class on grant writing. We're going to do a webinar on grant writing coming up here soon. You can't win if you don't apply. I mean, that's pretty much the only rule that I can give you guaranteed. If you're going to go after an award or a contest or anything like that, just apply for it. I have people who say, like, I'm just concerned that they won't think that my project is appropriate. I'm like, who gives a if they don't think it's appropriate, you won't get the award. That's the, I mean, it's kind of the just basic logic of how this works. If they think it's appropriate, you might get the award. <laughs> so one of my favorite expressions of the lovely woman sitting in this audience, um, it's like the most Connecticut thing I think you've ever said, and I use it all the time. I am a huge thank you note proponent. I write thank you notes for everything. I try to write reviews online for Yelp about everything. I wrote so many positive notes about my last flight on Delta, about the flight crew, that literally somebody came up to me and they said, are you Jamie Rose? And I said, yes. And she's like, I just wanted to tell you I have a note here to thank you for flying today. And I was like, really? <laughs> and Jane said one time, I said something about like, I need to send her an email to, about like a condolence email. And Jane said, Never write an email for a condolence letter or a thank you note. It's just gauche. <laughs> and it's totally true. Thank you notes are so important. Nobody gets handwritten letters anymore. And interestingly enough, you know, you can write a thank you note to the grant writing committee, the grant committee that's giving you the award. I, no lie, because I have so many of them with me when I travel all the time, have both of the kind of thank you notes that I send. <laughs> I have the, I bought a gigantic box from Amazon and they're super cute and there's like a million of these, sorry, it's upside down. And I have the Moo branded Memento workshops with a caption and everything thank you notes. It's got a nice picture from one of our photographers on there, that's Johnny Chung. And they're, they're very high quality, they're lovely, they don't really cost all that much, but they do get you so much traction for the people who feel like you're a considerate photographer, you've gone out of your way. Don't do it sending a thank you note with the invoice. That's not the right way to make it work. <laughs> Send it separately, spend the extra 55 cents or whatever on another stamp, and make sure that you know it looks nice and it's branded. This is uh, my, my last life lesson. I had the incredible honor this week of having two back-to-back -back workshops and Sarah Lean had decided to make a pivot point and she left National Geographic as the editor-in-chief after 15 years and as she was pivoting into her next stage of her career decided to sign up for both of my business workshops. I can't even tell you how intimidating that was. I was like, I just got to get through these two days and not think about it. <laughs> and, and she said, she introduced herself by saying to everyone, hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm a lifelong learner. And I thought that that was just incredible. I thought that was the best way to introduce yourself. Because I, first of all, I think it's incredible. Who's, who doesn't want to keep learning? Like, what boring people out there don't like learning new things? And so I study a lot. I, I'd love to say that I only listen to podcasts because they just, you know, inspire me and keep my creative juices fed. I listen to a lot of them for work 
it's not always fun. Sometimes I'm like, come on, Cody, dog, let's go for a walk because I want to listen to the latest podcast that's going to tell me what I need to know about my career or something like that. So keep studying, keep learning, keep reading, keep networking with other people. I have a couple of short lists of things that I recommend personally and Momenta recommends. Um, the Candid Frame podcast, I believe, is the preeminent photo um, <laughs> photo podcast out there. Abari Next Perello is, I mean, he's right up there with Tim Russert and one of the best interviewers you're ever going to meet. I, um, I'll have a confession to make. I do, I'm not afraid of public speaking in the slightest. Like this, this is not uncomfortable for me. I've only been nervous twice about any sort of speaking engagement this one and the candid frame because Abari X is so intelligent and it's so good. And I think he's up to like 485 or something like that interviews. And he interviews a different photographer every week. And we're talking Mary Ellen Mark and Anamia Davidson and Steve McCurry. And I mean, all of the greats. And then there's like the Jamie Roses that pop up into there. So um, I, I highly recommend that you, you take a look at this podcast. Vision Slightly Blurred is the podcast that Photo Shelter puts out. And um, it's, it's delightful. They just started it. It's, it's relatively new. And if you're not a photo shelter client, I highly recommend you think about it. We've had um, a photo shelter account since before Momenta began. And they have these really great newsletters where they put out um, state of the industries. So this last one was a, an entire PDF on applying for photo contests, the definitive guide for the photo contest for 2020, or the state of the fashion industry, fashion photography, street photography. They just do this every month and they're just so incredibly educational. And um, obviously the YouTube of the B&H event space is great. I really like how I built this. I find a lot of inspiration listening to other people who started their businesses from the ground up. Um, humanitarian Journalism is a new uh, website that I've just discovered. It's geared a lot towards writers, but I think that it's very insightful on like the impact of visuals and what it means to, you know, call into some of these questions about ethics and you know, there's a lot of things we can ask talk about in the questions if you guys want. Like, you know, is it you know, there's a lot of debate now. Should white photographers be allowed to photograph black issues? Should non native photographers be allowed to go into other countries and document this? You know, are we are we all diving into poverty porn and not really thinking about why it's being published and things like that? And they, they cover a lot of those issues and intelligently. Um, Momenta Workshops has our training programs that I highly recommend um, if you have any questions about them. We also have a number of alumni who have said, please send anyone my way who wants to know what it was like. But if you go onto our website on our blog, we have our alumni interviews and we have a series called Five Questions With. And we ask people five questions of the, all the same questions from the different workshops so you can get to know what it is. Um, that we do. And then Social Documentary Network is great and they also have a magazine that comes out twice a year called Zeke and it is stunning. It's absolutely beautiful work. If you are looking for funding, um, the Alexia Foundation is one of the most incredible funding, uh, funding organizations. If you are looking to give money to an organization, I highly recommend the Alexia Foundation. Uh, they are such a worthwhile organization. They launched people like Amy Vitale's career. And um, they give two types of awards for grant, grants um, annually, and they just actually finished the judging. So it's very exciting. I can't wait to hear. Um, and if you're a student and you apply for it, you have the option of coming on a Momenta workshop if you get one of the honorable mentions. The Blue Earth Alliance is interesting. They are a really exceptional group based out of Seattle, and they uh, have a what's called a fiscal sponsorship. If you don't know what that is, go ahead and Google it. You'll find a lot of information. Um, it allows them to share their 501c3 status with you so that you can grant right for your projects as a nonprofit because there's a lot more money out there for nonprofits than for individuals most of the time. The IWMF and We Women are um, women-specific grants that are available for people doing documentary coverage. The Ground Truth Project is very interesting. You guys should definitely take a look at it. They are, their mission is to help make a resurgence of community journalism in the country. They have a particular offshoot that they're doing right now called Report for America, and they're reporting on really interesting topics. They pick different um, journalists from around the country to help support on some of their long-term stories that newspapers aren't covering right now. It's really fun. And Candid 
Candid is the church that you should start attending if you want to do grad programs. Um, Candid used to be GuideStar and the Foundation Center mashed into one and they um, are where you go to look for the grant databases. They have something called Grant Space and it's like every single foundation, every single funding organization all in one place. And there's one in New York actually. They have um, New York, Washington DC, Cleveland, uh, San Francisco and Miami, I want to say, or Atlanta, I can't remember. They have um, satellite offices there and they have libraries full of books on grant writing and their librarians are incredible. They are so intelligent when you go in, you can just say, I'm an individual looking to do art grants or photography grants or you know mission grants and they will just send you in the right direction to help you search the database. They've got free webinars, they have paid webinars. I've done uh, presentations there for nonprofit organizations and so I highly recommend looking up Candid. And it's hard if you look up like Candid Grants or something like that, that it's a little confusing because they just changed their name. Um, Anyone who knows me knows that I really like to read. I read all the time if I can. And so this, this was the hardest slide for me to put together because I almost made the font a lot smaller and put like a whole bunch more books in there. But um, I think that this is kind of the, the, the starter kit for humanitarian journalism. Truth needs no ally. I really just wish every citizen would read this. I also think every citizen should read The Cruel Radiance. It's written by a college professor, so be warned. It's a, it's a little thick, like you need coffee and do it like first thing in the morning. Don't do it right before bed. I made that mistake and I just kept falling asleep. But it's excellent. Uh, Witness in Our Time is by Ken Light and Photography's Activism is great. There's actually a Momenta alumni in there. She interviewed on each page a different photographer about how they're using their photography for activism. And um, then the new rules of marketing and PR and small time operator. So if you want to do this, and this is going to be your job job as opposed to, I think I just want it to be like my side hustle or my you know fun retirement project. The new rules of marketing and PR are great. Um, it's by David Meerman Scott. There's another one coming out in March right now. You can get the ones on Kindle for very cheap if you want to wait until the next one comes out. But he has a podcast and blog and whatever, and he's this like high paid PR of the stars type of guy who realized about 10 years ago, I think the first, I read the very first edition, I think it's on like four or five or something now, that, oh my God, we charge so much money for our celebrity clients to put out press releases and stuff like this. And there's this thing called the internet that is ruining our business. <laughs> and so he decided to just pivot and say, okay, I'm gonna teach everyone else how to do my job and use the internet to do it for free. And so that's what that is. And small time operator is part of that, like if you don't have this particular strength in terms of business and stuff like that. In fact, if anyone's starting a small business, period, photo related or not, get that book, it's great. It teaches you how to stay in compliance with the IRS, everything. So it's very helpful. Um, and finally, I would just like to say, I think that part of what we need to do is to reach out and just be a little bit kinder. Um, in fact, my, my little camera cover is a sticker that says, be kind. And I try to make sure that I remind everyone and myself daily, let's try to be a little bit nicer to each other. Let's try to go out and use the photography that we have to change the world for the better instead of just slandering and bringing other people down. And I think that um, as part of that mission, you know, the people who came before me when it comes to, you know, talking to those who, who came before you, Chip Mowry is an amazing photo editor. He's at the Indianapolis Star Forever, Providence Journal. He's a um, decorated Vietnam veteran, just the, the coolest guy you're just ever gonna meet. And um, he always told everybody, just give back what you got. If you came here today and you learned something, I highly recommend you pass it on to at least three other photographers. Even if it's just telling them to get John Harrington's Best Business Practices book. That's the best advice you can give people. But make sure that when you are passing on the knowledge that you have and you're accepting the knowledge that other people are willing to give you, you know, it's, it's really important to, to keep sharing and to keep growing and to keep finding your community. And I hope every single one of you becomes humanitarian photographers. But if not, maybe you can find a way to support a humanitarian photographer or if you're a part of a nonprofit organization, encourage them to hire someone to do visuals. So I would like to thank you so much for having me today. I really, really feel honored that you, you stayed awake for two hours. <laughs> thank you.